The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare. Act Five, Scene One. A Churchyard. Enter two clowns with spades, etc. Is she to be buried in Christian burial that willfully seeks her own salvation? I tell thee she is, so make her grave straight. The crowner hath sat on her and finds it Christian burial. How can that be unless she drowned herself in her own defense? Why, tis found so. It must be se offendendo. It cannot be else. For here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act, and an act hath three branches. It is to act, to do, to perform. Argal, she drowned herself wittingly. Nay, but hear you, Goodman Delver. Give me leave. Here lies water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is, will he, nil he. He goes. Mark you that. But if the water come to him and drown him, he drowns not himself. Argal, he that is not guilty of his own death, shortens not his own life. But is this law? I marry ist, crowner's quest law. Will you have the truth, aunt? If this had not been a gentlewoman, she should have been buried out of Christian burial. Why, there thou sayest, and that more pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than their even Christian. Come, my spade, there is no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditchers, and grave-makers. They hold up Adam's profession. Was he a gentleman? He was the first that ever bore arms. Why, he had none. What, art a heathen? How dost thou understand the scripture? The scripture says, Adam digged. Could he dig without arms? If you answerest me not to the purpose, confess thyself. Go to. What is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? A gallows maker, for that frame outlives a thousand tenants. I like thy wit well in good faith. The gallows does well, but how does it well? It does well to those that do in. Now thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church. Our gall the gallows may do well to thee. Toot, come again. Who builds stronger than a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? Ay, tell me that, Eunoke. Mm, Mary, now I can tell. Toot. Mass, I cannot tell. Enter Hamlet and Horatio, at a distance. Cudgel thy brains no more about it, for your dull ass will not mend his pace with beating, and when you are asked this question next, say, A grave maker. The houses that he makes last till doomsday. Go, get thee to Johann. Fetch me a stoop of liquor. Exit second clown. First clown digs and sings. In youth when I did love, did love, me thought it was very sweet, to contract, O, oh, the time for ah, me behove. O, oh, me thought there was nothing meet. Has this fellow no feeling of his business, that he sings a grave-making? Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. Tis e'en so. The hand of little employment hath a daintier sense. Sings. But age with his stealing steps hath clawed me in his clutch, and hath shipped me into the land, as if I had never been such. Throws up a skull. That skull had a tongue in it, and could sing once how the knave jowls it to the ground, as if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. It might be the paint of a politician, which this ass now o'erreaches. One that would circumvent God, might it not? It might, my lord. Or of a courtier, which could say, Good morrow, sweet lord. How dost thou, good lord? This might mean by lord, such a one that praised my lord such a one's horse, when he meant to beg in it, might it not? Ay, my lord. Why, e'en so. And now my lady worms, chapless, and knocked about the mazard with a sexton's spade. Here's fine revolution. And we had the trick to seat. Did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at logards with them? Mine ache to think on't. Sings. A pickaxe and a spade, a spade for a shrouding sheet. Oh, a 
pit of clay to be made for such a guest is meet. Throws up another skull. There's another. Why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quiddities now, his quillets, his cases, his tenures, and his tricks? Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel, and will not tell him of his action of battery? <laughs> this fellow might be in time a great buyer of land, with his statues, his recognizances, his fines, his double vouchers, his recoveries. Is this the fine of his fines, and the recovery of his recoveries, to have his fine pate full of fine dirt? Will his vouchers vouch him no more of his purchases? <laughs> and double ones, too, than the length and breadth of a pair of indentures. The very conveyances of his land will hardly lie in this box. And must the interior himself have no more, huh? Not a jot more, my lord. Is not parchment made of sheepskins? Ay, my lord, and of calfskins, too. They are sheep and calves which seek out assurance in that. I will speak to this fellow. Whose grave is this, sirrah? Mine, sir. Sings. Oh, a pit of clay to be made, for such a guest is meet. I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in't. You lie out on it, sir, and therefore it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in it, and yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in't, to be in't, and say it is thine. Tis for the dead, not for the quick. Therefore thou liest. Tis a quick lie, sir, twill away again, from me to you. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none neither. Who? is to be buried in it. One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute the knave is. We must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us. By the Lord, Horatio, these three years I have taken note of it. The age is grown so picked that the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier he gaffs his kybe. How long hast thou been a grave-maker? Of all the days of the year, I came to it that day that our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born, he that is mad and sent into England. Ay, Mary, why was he sent into England? Why, because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there, or... If he do not, it's no great matter there. Why? T'will not be seen in him there. There the men are as mad as he. How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How strangely? Faith, e'en with losing his wits. Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. I have been sexed in here, man and boy, thirty years. How long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? If faith... If he be not rotten before he die, as we have many pocky courses nowadays that will scarce hold the laying in, he will last you some eight or nine year. A tanner will last you nine year. Why he more than another? Why, sir, his hide is so tanned with his trade that he will keep out water a great while, and your water is a sore decayer of the horse and dead body. Here's a skull now. This skull has lain in the air three and twenty years. Whose was it? A horse and mad fellows it was. Whose do you think it was? Nay, I know not. A pestilence on him for a mad rogue. I poured a flagon of rhinish on my head once. This same skull, sir, was Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This? In that. Let me see. Takes the skull. Ah, oh, alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now? How abhorred in my imagination it is, my gorge rims at it. He hung those lips, I 
have kissed I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chapfallen. Now, get you to my lady's chamber and tell her. Let her paint an inch thick to this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Prithee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked of this fashion in the earth? E'en so. And smelt so. Oh. Puts down the skull. E'en so, my lord. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole? Twere to consider too curiously to consider so. No, oh, faith, not a jot, but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it? As thus, Alexander died, Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth into dust, the dust is of earth. Of earth we make loam. And why of that loam, whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperious Caesar, dead, turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that that earth, which kept the world in awe, should patch a wall to expel the winter flaw. Soft, but soft aside, here comes the king. Enter priest, etc., in procession, the corpse of Ophelia, Laertes, and mourners following, King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, their trains, etc. The queen, the courtiers, who is this they follow? And with such maimed rites, this doth betoken the course they follow, did with desperate hand, for do its own life. It was of some estate. Couch we a while and mark. Retiring with Horatio. What ceremony else? That is, Laertes, a very noble youth. Mark. Her obsequies have been as far enlarged as we have warranties. Her death was doubtful. And, but that great command oversways the order, she should in ground and sanctified have lodged till the last trumpet. For charitable prayers, shards, flints and pebbles should be thrown on her. Yet here she is allowed her virgin rites, her maiden strumments, and the bringing home of bell and burial. Must there no more be done? No more be done. We should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem and such rest to her as to peace-parted souls. Lay her in the earth, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring. I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. What's a fair Ophelia? Sweets to the sweet, farewell. Scattering flowers. I hoped thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. I thought thy bride bed to have decked sweet maid, and not have strewed thy grave. Oh, treble woe fall ten times treble on that cursed head, whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. Hold off the earth a while, till I have caught her once more in mine arms. Leaps into the grave. Now, pile your dust upon the quick end, dead, till of this flat a mountain you have made, to o'ertop old Pelion, or the skyish head of blue Olympus. Advancing. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? 
whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers. This is I, Hamlet the Dane. Le leaps into the grave. The devil take thy soul. Grappling with him. Thou prayest not well, I prithee. Take thy fingers from my throat. For though I am not splentive and rash, yet I have something in me dangerous, which th let thy wiseness fear. Hold off thy hand! Pluck them asunder. Hamlet! Hamlet! Gentlemen! 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 Could my lord be quiet? The attendants part them, and they come out of the grave. Why, I will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag. Oh, my son, what theme? I loved Ophelia. Forty thousand brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. What wilt thou do for her? Oh, he is mad, Laertes. For love of God, forbear him. Swoons! Show me what thou do. Would weep? Would fight? Would fast? Would tear thyself? Would drink up easel? Eat a crocodile? I'll do't. Dost thou come here to whine, to outface me with leaping in her grave? Be buried quick with her, and so will I. And if thou prate of mountains, let them throw millions of acres on us, till our ground, singeing his pate against the burning zone, make Osa like a wart. Nay, and thou'lt mouth, thou rant as well as thou. This is mere madness, and thus a while the fit will work on him. Anon, as patient as the female dove, when that her golden couplets are disclosed, his silence will sit drooping. Hear you, sir. What is the reason that you use me thus? I love you ever. But it is no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may. The cat will mew. And dog will have his day. Exit Hamlet. I pray you, good Horatio, wait upon him. Exit Horatio. To Laertes. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of quiet shortly shall we see. Till then, in patience our proceeding be. Exit. Scene two. A hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and Horatio. So much for this, sir. Now shall you see the other. You do remember all the circumstance? Remember it, my lord? Uh, sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Methought I lay worse than the mutines in the bilbos. Rashly, and praise be rashness for it, let us know. Our indiscretion sometimes serves us well, when our deep plots do pall, and that should teach us there's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. That is most certain. Up from my cabin, my sea-gown scarfed about me, in the dark groped I to find out them. Had my desire fingered their packet, and in fine withdrew to mine own room again, making so bold my fears, forgetting manners, to unseal their grand commission, where I found Horatio of royal knavery, an exact command, larded with many several sorts of reasons, importing Denmark's health and England's too, with Oh, such bugs and goblins in my life, that on the supervised no leisure baited, no, not to stay the grinding of the axe, my head should be struck off. Is it possible? Here's the commission. R read it at more leisure. But wilt thou hear me how I did proceed? I beseech you. Being thus benetted round with villainies, Ere I could make a prologue to my brains, they had begun the play. I sat me down, devised a new commission, wrote it fair. I once did hold it, as our status do, a baseness to write uh, fair, and laboured much how to forget that learning. But, sir, now 
it did me yeoman's service. Wilt thou know the effect of what I wrote? I, my good lord. An earnest conjuration from the king, as England was his faithful tributary, as love between them, like the palm might flourish, as peace should stiff her wheaten garland wear, and stand a comma between their amities, and many such like asses of great charge, that on the view, and knowing of these contents, without abatement further, more or less, he should the bearers put to sudden death, no shriving time allowed. How is this sealed? Why, even in that was heaven ordinant. I had my father's signet in my purse, which was the model of that Danish seal. Folded the writ up in the form of the other, scribed it, gave it the impression, placed it safely, the changeling never known. Now, the next day was our sea fight, and what to this was sequenced, thou knowest already. So Gildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. I man, they did make love to this employment. They are not near my conscience. Their defeat does by their own insinuation grow. Tis dangerous when the baser nature comes between the pass and fell in sensed points of mighty opposites. Why, what a king is this? Does it not, thinks thee, stand me now upon? He that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cozenage, is not the perfect conscience to quit him with this arm, and is not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in further evil? It must be shortly known to him from England what is the issue of the business there. It will be short. The interim is mine, and a man's life no more than to say one. But I am very sorry, good Horatio, the two Laertes I forgot myself. For by the image of my cause I see the portraiture of his. I'll court his favours, but sure the bravery of his grief did put me into a towering passion. Peace! Who comes here? Enter Osric. Your lordship is right welcome back to Denmark. I humbly thank you, sir. Dost know this water fly? No, my good lord. Thy state is the more gracious, for tis a vice to know him. He hath much land and fertile. Let a beast be lord of beasts, and his crib shall stand at the king's mess. Tis a cho. But, as I say, spacious in the possession of dirt. Sweet lord, if your lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I will receive it, sir, with all diligence of spirit. Uh, put your bonnet to his right use, tis for the head. I thank your lordship. It is very hot. No, believe me, tis very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. But yet methinks it is very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord. It is very sultry, as it were. I cannot tell how. But, my lord... His Majesty bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head. Sir, this is the matter. I beseech you, remember... Hamlet moves him to put on his hat. Nay, good my lord, for mine ease, in good faith. Sir, here is newly come to court Laertes, believe me an absolute gentleman, full of most excellent differences, of very soft society, and great showing. Indeed, to speak feelingly of him, he is the card or calendar of gentry, for you shall find in him the continent of what part a gentleman would see. Sir, his definement suffers no perdition in you, though, I know, to divide him in Vittorially would dizzy the arithmetic of memory, and yet by your neither, in respect of his quick sale. But... In the verity of extolment I take him to be a soul of great article, and his infusion of such dearth and rareness as, to make true diction of him, his semblance is his mirror. And who else would trace him his umbrage, nothing more? Your lordship speaks most infallibly of him. 
to concern us, sir, why do we wrap the gentleman in our more raw breath? Sir? It's not possible to understand in another tongue. You will do it, sir, really. What imports the nomination of this gentleman? Oh, laity. His purse is empty already. All's golden words are spent. Of him, sir. I know you are not ignorant. I would you did, sir, yet in faith if you did, it would not much approve me. Well, sir? You are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is. I do not confess that, lest I should compare with him in excellence, but to know a man well were to know himself. I mean, sir, for his weapon, but in the imputation laid on him by them, in his meat he's unfellowed. What's his weapon? Rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons, but well. The king, sir, hath wagered with him six Barbary horses, against the which he has imponed, as I take it, six French rapiers and poniards with their assigns, as girdled hangers and so. Three of the carriages in faith are very dear to fancy very responsive to the hilt's most delicate carriages, and a very liberal conceit. What call you the carriages? I knew you must be edified by the margin ere you had done. The carriages, sir, are the hangers. The phrase would be more germane to the matter, if he could carry cannon by our sides. I would it might be hangers till then. But on, six Barbary horses against six French swords. Their assigns and three liberal conceited carriages. That's the French bet against the Danish. Why is this imponed, as you call it? The king, sir, hath laid that in a dozen passes between yourself and him he shall not exceed you three hits. He hath laid on twelve for nine and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. How if I answer no? I mean, my lord, the opposition of your person in trial. Sir, I will walk here, in the hall. If it please his majesty, tis the breathing time of day with me. Let the foils be brought, the gentleman willing, and the king hold his purpose. I will win for him, and I can. If not... I will gain nothing but my shame and the odd hits. Shall I re-deliver you in so? To this effect, sir, after what flourish your nature will. I commend my duty to your lordship. Yours, yours. Exit, Osric. He does well to commend it himself. There are no tongues else for his turn. This lapwing runs away with the shell on his head. He did comply with his dug before he sucked it. Thus is he, and many more of the same bevy that I know the dressy age dotes on, only got the tune of the time and outward habit of encounter. A kind of yesty collection, which carries them through and through the most fond and winnowed opinions, and do but blow them to their trial. Their bubbles are out. Enter a lord. My lord, his majesty commended him to you by young Osric, who brings back to him that you attend him in the hall. He sends to know if your pleasure holds a play with Laertes, or that you will take longer time. I am constant to my purpose. They follow the king's pleasure. If his fitness speaks, mine is ready, now or whensoever, provided I be so able as now. The king and queen and all are coming down. In happy time. The queen desires you to use some gentle entertainment to Laertes before you fall to play. She well instructs me. Exit, lord. You will lose this wager, my lord. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. But thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. But it is no matter. Nay, good my lord. It is but foolery. But it is such a kind of gain-giving as would perhaps trouble a woman. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit. Not a whit. We defy augury. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not come, it will be now. If it be not now, 
yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man has aught of what he leaves, what is't to leave betimes? Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Laertes, Lords, Osric, and attendants with foils, etc. Come, Hamlet, come and take this hand from me. King Claudius puts Laertes' hand into Hamlet's. Give me your pardon, sir. I've done you wrong, but pardoned. As you are a gentleman, the presence knows. And you must needs have heard how I am punished with sore distraction. What I have done, that might your nature, honor, and exception roughly awake, I here proclaim was madness. Was Hamlet wronged Laertes? Never, Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be ta'en away, and when he's not himself does wrong Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. Who does it, then? His madness. If it be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wrong. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot mine arrow o'er the house and hurt my brother. I am satisfied in nature, whose motive, in this case, should stir me most to my revenge. But, in my terms of honor, I stand aloof, and will no reconcilement, till by some elder masters of known honor I have a voice and precedent of peace to keep my name ungored. But, till that time, I do receive your offered love like love, and will not wrong it. I embrace it freely, and will this brother's wager frankly play. Give us the foils. Come on. Come. One for me. I'll be a foil, ladies. In mine ignorance your skill shall, like a star in the darkest night, stick fiery off indeed. You mock me, sir. No, by this hand. Give them the foils, young Osric. Cousin Hamlet, you know the wager. Very well, my lord. Your grace hath laid the odds of the weaker side. I do not fear it. I have seen you both. But since he is bettered, we have therefore odds. This is too heavy. Let me see another. Slikes me well. These foils have all a length. Aye, my good lord. Set me the stoops of wine upon that table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, or quit in answer of the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordnance fire. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath, and in the cup a union shall he throw, richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Give me the cups, and let the kettle to the trumpet speak, the trumpet to the cannoneer without, the cannons to the heavens, the heavens to earth. Now the king dunks to Hamlet. Come, begin, and you the judges bear a wary eye. Come on, sir. Come, my lord. They play. One. No. Judgment. A hit. A very palpable hit. Well, again. Stay. Give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. Trumpets sound, and cannon shot off within. Give him the cup. Uh, I'll play this bout first. Set it by a while. Come. They play. Another hit. What say you? A touch. A touch, I do confess. Our son shall win. He's fat and scant of breath. Here, Hamlet, take my napkin, rub thy brows. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. <laughs> Good madam. <laughs> Gertrude, do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you, pardon me. Aside. It is the poisoned cup. It is too late. I dare not drink yet, madam, by and by. Come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hit him now. I do not think t Aside. And yet tis almost against my conscience. 
Come, for the third. Laertes, you do but dally. I pray you, pass with your best violence. I am afeard you make a wanton of me. Say you so. Come, on. They play. Nothing neither way. Have at you now. Laertes wounds Hamlet. Then in scuffling they change rapiers, and Hamlet wounds Laertes. Part them, they are incensed. Nay, come again. Queen Gertrude falls. Look to the queen there, ho. They bleed on both sides. How is't, my lord? How is't, Laertes? Why, as a woodcock to mine own sprenge, Osric, I am justly killed with mine own treachery. How does the queen? She swoons to see them bleed. No, no, the drink, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I am poisoned. Dies. Oh, villainy. Oh, let the door be locked. Treachery, seek it out. It is here. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. <sighs> Foul practice has turned itself on me. Lo! Here I lie, never to rise again. Th thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. The point? Envenomed too? Then venom to thy work. Stabs King Claudius. Treason! 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 Oh, yet defend me, friends, I am but hurt. Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. King Claudius dies. He is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. Ah, exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine... Ah, and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Dies. Heaven make thee free of it. Oh, oh, I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. <laughs> oh, wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale... And tremble at this chance, so that are but mutes or audience to this act, had I but time. Oh, as this fell sergeant death is tricked in his arrest. Oh, I could tell you. God let it be. Horatio, I'm dead. Thou livest. Report me and my cause are right to the unsatisfied? Never believe it. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Here's yet some liquor left. As thou art man, give me the cup. Let go by heaven, I'll have it. Oh, good Horatio. What a wounded name. Things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me. In thy heart absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. March afar off, and shot within. What warlike noise is this? Young fort in brass, with conquest come from Poland, to the ambassadors of England gives this warlike volley. Oh, I die, Horatio. This potent poison quite outgrows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice, so tell him. With the occurrence, 
more and less which have solicited. The rest is silence. <laughs> Dies. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Why does the drum come hither? March within. Enter Fortinbras, the English ambassadors, and others. Where is this sight? What is it you would see? If aught of woe or wonder, cease your search. This quarry cries on havoc. Oh, proud death! What feast is to word in thine eternal cell that thou so many princes at a shot so bloodily hast struck? The sight is dismal, and our affairs from England come too late. The ears are senseless that should give us hearing. To tell him his commandment is fulfilled, that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, where should we have our thanks? Not from his mouth had it the ability of life to thank you. He never gave commandment for their death. But since, so jump upon this bloody question, you from the Polack Wars, and you from England, are here, arrived, give order that these bodies, high on a stage, be placed to the view. And let me speak, to the yet unknowing world, how these things came about. So shall you hear, of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and, in this upshot, purposes mistook, fallen on the inventor's heads. All this can I truly deliver. Let us haste to hear it, and call the noblest to the audience. For me, with sorrow I embrace my fortune. I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now to claim my vantage doth invite me. Of that I shall have also cause to speak, and from his mouth whose voice will draw on more. But let this same be presently performed, even while men's minds are wild, lest more mischance on plots and errors happen. Let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage. For he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royally. And, for his passage, the soldier's music and the rites of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. A dead march. Exunt, bearing off the dead bodies after which a peal of ordnance is shot off. End of Act 5 End of Hamlet by William Shakespeare